All right, so we come to this chapter and we find it a little bit of a difficult chapter and maybe it's more difficult for me as the one who has to teach on something because there aren't that many verses to teach on, correct? So this could be looked at as kind of a transitional chapter from where we've been and what we've been looking at. Now we're on kind of the, the hill, so to speak, and then we're heading in a different direction starting next week. So as um, I stated at our very first lesson together, the first six chapters were really about the reconstruction of the wall. These next chapters are gonna be about the reinstruction of the people. So it's all about having a different focus now, not just construction and building, now it's more turning the eye towards the people. The, the walls are completed, the gates are hung, um, the enemy had been humiliated, hadn't he? Time after time, he had been put down in his place. But the work, Nehemiah's work, still wasn't finished, and he knew it. We've been able to see the character of this man throughout the chapter. We've seen a man of prayer. Every time there's issue, he goes to prayer. He's on his knees. Uh, he's a man of courage. He isn't afraid to stand up to opposition to the enemy. And he's a man full of integrity. He keeps his word. People are listening to him because he's a man that they can follow. And that's a beautiful thing. His first objective was to build the walls, and that he did well. But a city is much more than just walls and gates. It's actually a city is the people that live in those walls. It's the people. Warren Wiersbe said that in the first half of the book, the people existed for the walls but now the walls must exist for the people. And I think that's a really good word. We need to remember that. The main goal had been, and they're so unified and working together, pulling all that effort together to get those walls rebuilt, to uh, get along and listen to each other and all of that in 52 days. I mean, honestly, I don't think we can fathom the the enormous job that that was. For it to be included, to tell us the actual days, somebody's counting those days, right? And for the Holy Spirit to include it in, our, in, our, in the Bible, that means it was something huge. If you've ever had a construction uh, remodeling or something in your home, come on, 52 days? You know, it's always two weeks, how much longer? Two weeks, how much longer? Two weeks, you know, it's always two weeks. And you know, you just look at the construction that's been going on. They, they hit uh, many pitfalls. Now we've got, we may be having to break up the whole wedding courtyard uh, thing because of this uh, issue that's going on with the sewer system. So there's just a lot going on. So please keep that in prayer. But anyways, it's an amazing feat today to finish any big construction work and we have all the equipment that they didn't have back then. We have all of that at our fingertips, and still, it's a difficulty. Uh, Nehemiah, his focus uh, had been on the walls, like I said. Now he's gonna start to organize the people. So you start to see these leadership skills of his really coming into action. He wanted to make sure that as the people are coming together, they're repopulating the city, that it's a healthy, strong community, that they're gonna live together peacefully the way God intended for them to live. And I love how God is always looking down the road. We only see what's in front of us. We only know, we may have plans for tomorrow and next week and next year, but we only know what's before us today. We only have today. We know we're here today, praise the Lord, but we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't even know what's gonna happen this afternoon. We can imagine, you might have a million things you have to do, but we don't honestly know. And God does though. And he still had great things in store for the city of Jerusalem. As one day in the distant future, his son is gonna walk on those streets. He's gonna enter through those gates. He's gonna teach in the temple. And he's gonna die outside those gates that have been rebuilt, the walls. So there, his eye is always and always will be on the city of Jerusalem. This is a very uh, important place in, in him, in his eyes, and it should be in ours as well. So in chapter seven, just to do a little bit of analysis, we can look back at chapter three, you don't have to turn there, but there was a long list of names there as well. 
Um, but there was a little bit of rep repetitious phrases that were in there. It was a little bit easier to understand and follow through. Um, however, we don't really see that as much in this chapter. Very, very long chapter full of many uh, names listed in there. I read a quote of a commentator and, that I really liked. He said, whenever you're faced with a problem of interpretation, climb a contextual tree. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a good word. That's awesome. You need to go up. So I thought about being lost in the woods. Um, hopefully none of you have ever experienced that. I haven't either. But I know what that fear would be like if you're taking a hike and you were to get lost, especially if you were alone, which would not be wise, but people do it. The best option would be, I need to go to a high place. I need to see where I'm at. I need to see where the road is that I need to get back so I can get out of here, right? Because if you don't figure where you're at and you continue going in the wrong direction, you're gonna be even more lost. I've seen some of these stories before of people who got way off because they thought for sure the way out was one way and they were way off and wrong. So the insight and understanding we can gain from being in a high place, climbing a tree if you had to, if you were really that lost, go to a high place so that you can see that road. And the Lord has used Psalm 61.2 for me, not in being lost in the woods, but being lost in other ways, right? Uh, it says there that when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When I feel a little lost, I need to go to that high place because I can see the way clearly. I can see the path out um, and the way that I should go. You know, we sang this song, uh, Psalm 121, we, Gia just shared that with us, that we sang, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So always looking up to him, that's where I need to go to find answers, to find solutions. When I'm confused or lost or a little frightened, go to that high place. When you're overwhelmed, go to the rock that is higher than you. His ways are not our ways. He knows more than we do. We only know this moment. He's the alpha and the omega, knowing the beginning from the end. He knows everything. And that's true physically as well as spiritually when we're lost, when we have that feeling. Uh, both physically, spiritually. So for me in this chapter, I was feeling a little bit lost, and uh, so to speak. And when you do come to a difficult portion like that, you can lose sight of the main purpose of the book. So in tackling chapter seven, uh, we're gonna climb a contextual tree a little bit, just to kind of look back and to look forward to where we're headed. So from the top of that treetop, or from the rock that is higher than I, we can look at what's been happening, and what's been happening is that Nehemiah has rebuilt the walls. That mission is accomplished. The objective, the goal was met. Praise God, they made it through this far, right? He excelled despite great opposition, and he stood steadfast, he stood strong. No matter what was he was being hit with, he was gonna finish what the Lord had commissioned him to complete. And these are important reflections as we look back to remember the uh, insight and understanding we got from when we look at uh, the previous lessons and what Nehemiah has been teaching us all along. However, chapter seven transitions and shows us now his organization, his delegating skills. Now he is really going into action. He's really thinking, uh, forward thinking about what is the city and the people living in it gonna look like? What are they going to need? And one of the first things he does is, um, you know, appoint some assistance, which is awesome. Looking at chapter eight, starting next week, uh, beautiful interruption to even the plan there. Beautiful interruption about a spiritual awakening that happened to the people. And those are wonderful interruptions to any plan we might have, right? So we pray today, God, send revival. Send revival to us. Interrupt us in any way you want to do that work. Just beautiful. So the first four verses of this chapter show how beautifully Nehemiah 
appointed that new leadership. And you can turn there if you like, but I'm just going to read those verses. Then it was when the wall was built and I'd hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. Awesome. And I said to them, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut the doors and bar them and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few and the houses were not built. That's really the reason why the people were few. The houses weren't built. How can you live in there? But the people who are in there, boy, is he setting into a plan of action how this is gonna look. And now he's engaging really in phase two of the mission, so to speak, the plan to rebuild the people, to get them set into action. So he starts out by appointing reliable men, men he could delegate certain responsibilities to. He's not a control freak. He is not doing everything himself and just barking orders at everybody. He's actually delegating out skilled, experienced, God-fearing, faithful men. That's what is pointed out there. He knew that every good leader needs assistance, and that is so true. So he chose these two men, Hanani and Hananiah, right off the bat. Now, those two names are so close, that would have been tough. <laughs> I only had two kids with very different names, and I was always getting them mixed up. I'm calling them by the dog's name and by anything but their name. I still do it today. My granddaughter, I'm still calling her my younger daughter, because my younger daughter was the sass, so my granddaughter can be sassy. So I'm always calling them the opposite names, and it's just like, oh, my goodness. But I used to tell my kids, well, you, the important thing is you know your name. So I don't have to, no, no, I'm kidding. But I did say that to them. Um, so Hananiah, you know, he grew up with him. That's his brother. He knows him. I don't think it was nepotism that he appointed him. Maybe he got harassed for that. But I don't think so. I don't think Nehemiah was that foolish. This is such a big deal. There's probably a lot of other men he could have chosen, but he chose him, a good man. Love God, faithful. And those are the two qualities we see, huge. God-fearing, faithful. Those are two amazing qualities to have. You can't get better than that. If someone fears God, guess what? They're gonna be faithful because they fear God. They love God, they're pleasing God. Uh, the opposite though is true as well. When leaders fear people instead of God, uh, disaster can happen. They will get trapped in that. I've been there. I, years, many, when I was a young woman, young, young, uh, I was a people pleaser. I was insecure, so I, I thought everybody should like me. You know, I wanted everybody to like me. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing per se, and yet uh, it is because it was about me. I had a friend, a very sweet, awesome friend who ended up mentoring me who told me, Lisa, that's pride. And I was like, pride? That's not pride. I, I care what people think because I'm... Uh, a witness of the Lord, you know, and she goes, no, it's pride. She goes, go, go look in the scripture, prove your point. I went home and I searched my scripture and I'm looking at Jesus and I'm like, mm, she's right. Every time, Jesus never cared what anybody thought about him or said about him. It always said he was moved with compassion for them. He was always others centered, not me centered. When you are fearing people, you're a people pleaser. You care more about what people think about you. And it's like, oh, die, die, die. We have to die to those. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Isn't that a good word? We'll be safe. Being fearful in the wrong things or people is disastrous. We get in a lot of trouble. But leaders who fear God will do the right thing, whether it's comfortable or not. And unfortunately, having leaders like that is a dying breed. You don't see it much in government, anybody who's ruling over you, or in the pulpits. And that's very, very sad. 
Not everyone's going to be like Nehemiah, a Nehemiah, uh, but we can come alongside those who we see are uh, showing some of those attributes. Work with like-minded people to get jobs done, to get ministry accomplished, by helping them however, whenever, and in whatever role you might play. Be a servant. Be the servant of all is what we're told. God looks for such people who have strong convictions and steadfast faith, God-fearing and faithful. So, Nehemiah then appoints gatekeepers, and I love this gatekeeper thing. They made sure that nobody entered who wasn't supposed to enter, someone who might be wanting to cause trouble. And I love how specific he was. Don't let anybody in until the sun is hot. And I think that just means broad daylight. Don't be opening the gates up at 5 a.m. when the sun's you know, still starting to just rise or whatever. No, you wait till it's broad daylight. You can see these faces, you can see what's going on, you know who they are, you know what they're up to, all that good stuff. So, and then make sure when you close those gates, you guard them, you protect them, you bar the gate. Very explicit, specific instructions. They guarded the entrance to keep it safe. Gatekeepers know how to protect the walls and the gates, but their homes still weren't built. So it's still very precarious. They, they were, he's working from the outside in, which is very cool. Uh, there were also watchmen. I mean, gatekeepers are kind of like watchmen. And, and the Bible has a lot to say about watchmen on the wall and keepers of the gates. Uh, remember in Nehemiah 4, 9, it said, but we prayed to our God and because of them, our enemies, we set up a guard against them day and night, all day. All night, they continued to guard the gates, to guard all the work that was trying to be accomplished. And let's not forget that today, gatekeepers are still important. We are all to be gatekeepers to a certain extent. They protect the house of the Lord, the church, not just the building, although that's part of it. That's why we have People here stationed and, and guarding. They're being careful to make sure nobody with ill intent. We live in a very wicked world and people who will do wicked things to hurt. So we have set that up as a guard to protect the people in here. Not just the building though, but the people. From corruption, from worldly ideas, from sneaking in. Didn't Paul have a lot to say? Those who would try to sneak in and deceive the people. We need to be on guard. Gatekeepers stand true to the word of God and they don't waver, they don't drift away from his commands, from his truth. They don't compromise, right? We heard a lot about that last week. They protect others from following lies, from false ideas, from wrong doctrine because they care, they love. They love the body of Christ, not just your friend, everybody. They help keep the sheep safe by keeping watch until he returns. That's what we're to do as gatekeepers, as watch, watch women <laughs> instead of watchmen. Um, anyways, they don't look just to the church for protection. They're not looking always for somebody else to do that job. They step up and do it as well. So let me ask you, are you a gatekeeper in the sense that you pray diligently? Are you someone that others can depend on for prayer? Do you seek protection and wisdom from Almighty God who is more than able to protect and provide for you? Do you trust him in that way? Are you a gatekeeper of your own heart? Are you careful what you see, what you listen to, what you watch, your heart, your mind, your eyes? Are you a gatekeeper of your home? Do you watch over the ways of those who live under your roof? Maybe it's your children that are still there. Maybe it's your grandchildren. Any who would enter, what are they saying? What are they doing? What are they watching? What are they talking about? What are they reading? What are they looking at? I don't mean be a snoopy, intrusive, weird person, okay? I'm not saying be controlling. I'm saying be wise. Be on the lookout. Because evil is lurking all the time. 
Don't ever think it's just, oh, oh, it's those people over there that have these really important jobs that the enemy's after. No, he's after, it says he hates every single one of us who proclaim the name of Christ. Are you gatekeepers of your church, your ministry, carefully giving guidance when something doesn't seem right or just seems a little off and you really don't know why? Are you prayerful about that? Are you careful? Do you alert someone that maybe that's not the best thing, prayerfully? Are you a gatekeeper of your community? Like neighborhood watches, maybe are you in that? Maybe you're not involved in that per se, but are you careful? Do you know your neighbors? Are you kind of looking out when you look out your window? There's a guy creeping around, climbing in their window. What's that, you know? I don't mean to be a snoop and you got your binoculars on your neighbors and you know everything that's going on in the neighborhood. No, this is just being wise, being careful, being smart, really. Um, in, a, in a crooked and perverse generation in which we live is what the Bible refers to all of this, right? These are all important aspects of being a gatekeeper. I just think we need to have that thought. Not just look back and read this old book and say, oh yeah, they had the gatekeepers, okay, that's cool, because they had the walls and they had the doors. And No, it, it goes much further than that for us, that we can take some of these things in our own lives. We may not be watching the city gates the way they did back then, but there are still all these different aspects of being a gatekeeper, and they're important in our own daily lives. Then it says that Nehemiah appointed singers. And singing, you know, has always been a beautiful way to worship God. We love coming here and singing. Just before this, we were singing beautiful praises to God. It lifts our heart. It's so beautiful. And there's many examples throughout the Old Testament of singing in the Bible. Um, Did you know that at creation, even the stars sang? Is that beautiful? I tell you, that's awesome. In Job 38, God asked Job a series of questions because Job, after all the hardships and trials he had gone through, is struggling now and I think has forgotten the majesty of God. So God begins to turn and ask many, many questions. If you've never read Job starting around 38 to like 42 maybe, uh, 41, 42, read those chapters. I love reading those chapters because I am reminded of the greatness of God. He's great, he's awesome. But in there, it, uh, uh, God is asking, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Kind of puts everything back into place, right? Who determined its measurements? Did you, Job? And where were you when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy, the angels? Isn't that awesome? Boy, do I want to hear. Someday, I hope we get to hear the stars singing. It's been so long since I was out in a very dark area, and you can actually see stars. Uh, That's such a wonderful thing to do. We used to camp a lot when our girls were growing up, and it was so wonderful to get out there and just see the Milky Way and the stars. My grandsons love space, so they know all the names of these stars out there, it's just crazy what they know. Um, And all the different universes, they just keep going on and on and on and on. It's just unbelievable. But to know that all of that saying at creation is beautiful, awesome thing. The Old Testament has many examples of singing uh, to the Lord, such as when Moses and the Israelites were delivered from the Egyptians, they sang a song in Exodus 15. Barak and Deborah sang a song of deliverance from their enemies in Judges 5. And it's certainly not difficult to imagine little David as a shepherd boy out in the field watching the sheep with his harp. When he wrote many of the psalms that you read, they were put to music. So he's out there not only writing the psalms, but singing, praising God, learning the power of worship because he's building his own faith as he's singing those songs, and that's what happens to us as well. He learned the importance of worship to God. Just a short time later, he's gonna be slaying a giant, you know, slinging a slingshot, boom, to kill that big behemoth of a man. Uh, But he stood on the power 
of God because he knew his God. He worshipped his God. Worship is very powerful. And at the time when David was king, music and singing became even more prominent because he, um, he actually appointed 4,000 gatekeepers and 4,000 musicians and singers to keep the house of the Lord. So not only are they guarding it, they're singing and praising God. Remember he got caught just off guard singing in his underwear and his wife got all mad at him. You know, oh, who do you think you are, you know? And she was kind of cursed by him after that. But, um, you know, those musicians were told to play loudly with cymbals and harps, just make music unto God. God must love music. He must just love it. So don't come to church with the attitude of, oh, it's okay, it's just worship. Really? Really? It's just worship? It's just singing. This is those people. Is that what you're doing? Are you here for a concert or are you here to enter into worship? We have to ask ourselves that because it's powerful. If there's ever a time you hear in your voice, um, a voice in your head saying, ah, oh, you don't need to. Or, you know, I, I once uh, counseled a lady who, um, and it's happened to other women too, but this one particular lady, she couldn't sit in worship. She always had to leave. Like, I, I got to get out of here. It made her very uncomfortable. So you hear that voice? It's, it's, it's from below. You rebuke that, that voice there. You, don't, you take up that thought captive because there's power in worship. Psalm 22, 3 says that God inhabits the praises of his people. That's beautiful. He wants to hear you sing. Psalm 95 says to shout joyfully to the rock of your salvation. The psalmist also said, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our Lord, our God, our maker. That's who you're singing to. I don't know if often you get on your knees alone, but it's a good thing to do. It's that, it's that humility that we are before Almighty God. And there's great purpose in worship and singing. It lifts our soul. It proclaims the wonders of God. It causes our faith to grow as we bow before him in humble adoration. You don't have to physically bow. If you're here, you can bow in your heart. You know the sincerity of it. You can bow. But um, it's the attitude of the heart. And if the stars can sing out loudly, surely we can too. They're stars. They haven't been redeemed. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Next, Nehemiah appointed the Levites, and theirs was an incredibly important job, vital. They had very strict requirements as well, and they were descendants of Levi. You had to be a descendant of Levi, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, and you couldn't serve unless you could prove that lineage because it was all about keeping the purity of the priesthood, the purity and sanctity of what is being done in that temple. It is holy. If the, if the high priest went into the holy of holies, not prepared, not going through all the rituals that he was commanded to, he could literally die. There's a time where the Levites were carrying the ark. There were specific instructions about how to carry the ark of the covenant. And one guy, it started to wiggle and he touched it and he was killed right then and there, dead, boom, because you weren't supposed to do that. And David got very upset with God for a while because he couldn't believe you did this. You know, sometimes we have that with God. We don't understand something. Or why is he doing what he's doing? We can get upset with him. But work your way through. <laughs> get over it and realize he's God and he has every answer. We don't have every answer. We don't understand everything. He does. He has a purpose to everything. He never has a bad day and just does something because he had a bad day. We have bad days and we say things we shouldn't have. He never does. So know there's a reason for everything he does. During the great exodus, the Levites had that crucial job of supporting not only the ark, the tabernacle, all its belongings, all the furniture, specific um, uh, requirements. Because 
eventually this will prevent any mishandling of those objects. They are, God had set them apart as holy. They were sacred. It might not be holy to you. It was deemed holy to him. So he gave those specific instructions. The Levites also taught the law to, of Moses to the people. The first five books of, the, of, uh, yeah, of our Bible today is called the Torah. So they taught that to the people. They would copy scripture texts. They would promote obedience to God and following the laws. Remember, not everybody had a scroll like we do. We have this. We have the sacred scripture we hold in our hands, we have in our homes. But how sacred really is it to us? Do we look at it as holy? It even says on most of our Bibles, the holy scripture, the holy Bible, because it is holy. Why? Because it's his word. In Hebrews it says it's alive, it's powerful. It has the ability to transform your heart and your mind from the inside out, change you, redeem you, make you a new person, a new creation, everything. No other book ever. I don't care how great your devotional book might be, it's not this. But do we leave it on the shelf to collect dust? Do we actually open it and, and praise him for it? Is it sacred in our hearts and our minds? You'll find out more about that later, how important in the chapters to come, as we study about revival, the importance, what joy it brought their hearts. And our man Ezra that we've looked at, he was a Levite. He was a scribe. He was skilled in the law of Moses. He too led the people in revival and reformation. Beautiful work that Ezra did too. The, the Levites would also serve as gatekeepers especially around the area of the temple. There was the courtyard, the outer courtyards, there were uh, walls around that as well. And they made sure that no unauthorized people would get into that holy area. They were to be holy as he is holy. And 1 Peter 1.15, the same is repeated for us. We're not off the hook. Be holy, for I am holy. That's something we need to think about. We're to live holy and sanctified lives before him, set apart. We're not the world, we're not to act like the world, we're not to speak like the world, and we're not supposed to even care what the world would think about us, right? If they criticize us, let it be because we are Christians, not because of something we've said or done that was sinful but because of who he is in our lives. So in looking at Nehemiah 7, 63 and 64, the couple of verses there we saw in that long list of names was um, the Levite specifically spelled out, I'm sorry, you don't have any papers, so to speak. You don't have any proof that you are a Levite, therefore you can't serve. Now that had to be, I'm sure, very disappointing to some people who came after the captivity. They've been away a long time. Maybe they were a Levite before the captivity. Now they've been away. Now they have no proof. So it would be very disappointing for them. But these were requirements until they could prove it somehow, some way. You know, they didn't have social security cards and IDs and passports like we do today to prove that you are who you are. So I'm sure it was difficult. That's why these documents, these names are so important because the genealogies that will go into the New Testament about Jesus' bloodline, that's the importance of it when you go back and see these lists. Sometimes we can look at these lists and just pass over and go, okay, whatever, you know, these people, I'm just gonna keep reading, this is boring, this has no meaning to me. Sure, maybe you don't know who these people are, I get it, but the Holy Spirit saw it important enough to to uh, document it, to put it there for our uh, reading. Why? Because our God is such a detailed God. And don't you love that? Don't you want him to be detailed about your life? Don't you want him to know, oh, wait, who are you again? I don't know, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, maybe you accept the Lord, not sure, didn't write your name down. <laughs> no, we want our name written down, don't we? We want to know that we are in the Lamb's Book of Life. So each of these names was a real person. 
real person, very important. They lived a long time ago. They have a historical meaning to their names because they were those that came back to reclaim the city of Jerusalem. It's very important. Written for a special reason, a special time that they'd never be forgotten. You know, their names, like I said, we can't even pronounce most of them, but they're there. And it may not seem important to us, but to God it's very important. They were called. They had a mission. They had a work that God wanted them to accomplish, and they did. And their names were recorded for all to see. And it's actually a, a beautiful reminder for uh, the care, of the care that God has for his people. He cares. God is intimately aware of every detail of our lives as well, including our names. Yay. It's amazing to think that out of the billions of people on earth today, or all of the, I guess, billions of people that have ever lived since creation, God knows all the names. He's never forgotten. In fact, Luke 12 says that he knows every hair on our head. Now, that's crazy to me. That's just absolutely crazy. Um, I love and adore my children and grandchildren. I have never cared to ever count the hairs on their heads, <laughs> nor could I. But that's the detail of who our God is. You ever been around someone that you really, maybe you were introduced to someone that you really admired and... Um, you know, a way, a long, you know, time passed and you see them again and they remembered your name. You know, that would make you feel really special. Well, think how much more important it is that God knows your name and never, ever forgets your name or anything about you. People might forget your name, but he never will. Not only that, um, the next time you feel as though God has forgotten you, Remind yourself of the verse, because I'm always amazed about the hair thing, right? I just really am. I, 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 maybe that's something I'll have to ask, or maybe I'll know when I get there. Why? You know, why was that important? It goes to show you how important the smallest detail is of, of us to him. So, it means something. Names are personal. Names are personal to us. Names are personal to God. Isaiah 43, 1, it says, But now says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. That's for you, ladies. You're his. If you're his child, that should give you a great sense of belonging. You're never alone. You're never forgotten. Even the stars have names. Did you know that? They sang out, but they have names. Psalm 147.4 says, He counts the number of the stars, and he calls them all by name. That's phenomenal. Our God is awesome. If the stars have name, names, and they can't be redeemed, how much more important is your name to him? Exodus 33.17, uh, God said to Moses, You have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Isn't that great? How many times God throughout scripture brings up our names? Isaiah 49, 16, he goes even further. He says, see, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. That's awesome. He loves you. What do you hear in those words? Do you know how much he loves you? Do you really believe that? Do you really trust him at that level that you know he has that kind of love for you? Every time he looks at his hands, he sees your name. I love that. Whenever you're feeling out of sorts and all along, read Psalm 139. I love that chapter. Remind yourself of the goodness of Almighty God and what he thinks of you. I'm gonna read a couple verses from the New Living. I just like the way it sounded. Verse 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Remember I told you, he's the Alpha and Omega. He already knows everything about your life. What's gonna happen next week or 10 years from now? God forbid he doesn't come back, but <laughs> um, he knows it. 
How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered, his thoughts. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. Try to pick up a handful of sand and think if you ever could count the grains of sand. When I wake up, you're still with me. Are you ever alone, ladies? The answer is no. You might feel it here, but you're never alone. That's where when you have to take thoughts captive and you've got to go back to him and remind yourself. Someone once said, preach to yourself. Yeah, preach to ourselves sometimes, especially when you're down and out. Even David said, why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Hope thou in God. I love that because he's just preaching to himself. Soul, what are you so depressed about? Why are you so disquieted? Hope thou in God. So even in that, he's reminding himself and reminding us. We've all been called for a purpose. God has a plan for each one of us. If he's your Lord and Savior, then he's ordained you for such a time as this. In this moment in history, this is the day that was preordained before creation. He knew us, and he ordained we would live in this time period, right? Because he's got a plan for us. But what's going to be recorded about us? These people have records written. What legacy are we leaving? We're all going to stand before him. We're all going to give an account, not of our sin that's been forgiven, but we will give an account of what we've done for him. And good, bad, or ugly, some will be uh, burned as wood, hay, and stubble. Others, we're going to receive a crown. And I'm hoping someday I at least have one crown, right? Just one would be nice. Everything doesn't get burned. I hope not. Um, and I'm going to end with this verse to remind you that you're his child, that you're his and his alone. 1 Peter 2.9 says, you are a chosen people. You are royal priests. You're a holy nation. God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you had no mercy, now you've received God's mercy. Do you believe that? Do you trust him in that? Do you see yourself as holy, as royal, as chosen, as a possession, as loved, as cherished. That's what he desires you to know. And I hope that you do feel that. I hope every one of you have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I hope if anybody here is unsure of that, that you would make sure that you are with him throughout all of eternity because he loves you so much. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how we thank you, God, for your word, even in particular areas of your word where maybe we stumble, we get lost a little bit, we don't know what's going on, um, it seems confusing or pointless. Oh God, you always have a reason. You have recorded everything in your word for a purpose. And Lord God, we thank you for it. Lord, I pray for these women that they would understand the great love that you have for them, that you know our names. You're even going to give us a new name, it says in Revelation. We don't know what that is, but Lord, we don't even care as long as we're there with you. I pray for any woman who doesn't know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, how much you love her, that you know her name, that your thoughts towards her are good. If she hasn't reconciled that with you. Lord, I pray that she would do that this day. Lord, we thank you, God, for loving us so very much. And we praise you and honor you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you.